Would you care? Why don't you tell us a little story if you want to warn it out about New Orleans? I have never told. I don't think I've ever told it very often. Uh, uh, here's what happened, uh, or here's what my experience was. What happened, I really don't know. We uh, went and we checked in to uh, some hotel in the Latin Quarter, the Marriott or something like that, you know, right on Basin Street there, you know, right. Bourbon Street or whatever the hell it is. And um, went to the gig. After the gig, I filmed with some uh, local hippies there in uh, New Orleans and went to their place and hung out for a long time and raved. So about 4.30, maybe, I come back to the hotel and go up to the floor that we're on. I have my guitar case, you know, I'm walking along. I noticed about every second door is open and the lights are on, you know, and nobody's around. It's a bit strange, you know, so I come up to where my room is. The door is wide open. There's two guys in there with my suitcase open going through it. Really? They weren't me. And I looked right. I looked in, and then I just kept walking. <laughs> <laughs> I got almost to the corner of the corridor, and one of the guy goes, "Hey, you, <laughs> buddy, me? I'm not doing anything." Yes, they call me back in. It turns out everybody's been taken in, so they took me down. I got to go all by myself. You know, they were sort of polite. We end up. I. They take me to the captain's office rather than to like a holding tank, well, where everybody's good. being booked and Press photographed. And it, there's everybody in the whole band, all the crew, everybody in the band <laughs> sitting around on the floors and stuff like that, everybody joking, you know, <laughs> making a lot of noise. And there we are, you know, we've been snapped. Really? Then they take us to the jail, you know, which is, uh, God, I don't, know, I don't know whether you've ever been in the jail in the South before. <laughs> Louisiana is one of the few states that still has chain gangs, you know, <laughs> the pajamas and, uh, you know, chain gangs, you know. And uh, there they have. Uh, I have a <laughs> kind of an orientation uh, hour, you know, where they hip you to the horrors of Southern justice. <laughs> Quickly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then when we went through all the standard things, the thing of being locked in a little small cell for a long time, finally getting photographed, processed through, and all the rest of that, we were we got bailed the next morning sometime, after uh, sitting for hours with uh, a lot of weird types, you know, set up. Was it? Well, our feeling is that there was a, I think the trip was that there was a bellboy working in the hotel who was a criminology major. He was a local school and uh, <coughs> who did his part for the department by, you know, Boston the, Big uh, Yeah, right. Mr. Right. Big. Owsley was there with us, too. Oh, really? Yeah. Probably and wasn't they really thought they had something hot, you know. Oh, this is it. You know. A lot of photographs. A lot of photographs. How come we haven't seen any of them? Uh, because they're all cop photographs, not uh, media photographs. There may have been one or two media people. There was one point where they paraded us from from uh, the captain's office, all of us handcuffed together, daisy chain style, you know? Really? <laughs> yeah, God, it was awful. Great album cover. <laughs> it would have been okay. Would have been only the fourth or fifth such photograph we'd have. Right. That was a great rock trivia thing, wasn't it? Wait, wasn't there another incident in New Jersey, too? Was yeah, I got popped in New Jersey on the New Jersey Turnpike. Same time uh, with somebody else. Too. Me and Hunter were riding together. Yeah. Um, and he got off clean. I was driving, of course, with no driver's license, and then they ran a car with no uh, papers and all that. And speeding to boot, you know, I mean, all that. Not all of this, you know, not just drugs, but uh, social... Uh, cultural uh, following it had since the beginning. Uh, so hardcore, and the spectrum is sold, and without advertising and all this, is a. Uh, I mean, you must have sat around lots of times and tried to understand that. I do. Well, the interesting thing about it is, that, and it uh, may or may not be visible from, uh, say, your point of view, or even from a uh, longtime Deadhead's point of view, is that it's not like the same audience all the time. There's a, a turnover. And uh, our audience, in fact, has been growing in a way we're the slowest rising rock and roll band in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and our audience has been growing. We have a lot of people in the audience who are really quite young, some of them like half our age, you know. Uh, and it's interesting. It, it leads us to believe something along the lines of that there is a kind of a minority group, regardless of, uh, say, generation or age or whatever, that can dig what we're doing. I ask them about it, and they're all really pretty polite and good people, nice people, intelligent usually. They like what we're doing because they don't know what we're going to do. Right. <laughs> they know that we're going for it, whatever it is. Is it close to like, uh, do you consider it close to jazz sometimes? Uh, yeah, what we do is very much, uh, very close to it in spirit, in the sense that, uh, that the material is, uh, for example, a song 
by our definition, is really lyrics, melody, line, and changes. Mm. Apart from that, arrangement considerations um, are things that we don't rehearse or put together or, you know, evolve in quite that way. Have you become the master of the visual cue? Well, we're all pretty good at it, but that's one of the things, too, is that we all cue each other. No one of us is uh, really leading at any particular moment. For example, when I'm singing, it's uh, common for Bob to be signaling dynamic changes mm -hmm. or uh, accents. He's gotten real good at calling accents, you know. He can get the whole band to accent, like, on the two or the end of three, just with a single. And it ends up sounding amazing. Of course, for years, it sounds awful, you know. <laughs> three people would catch it. Right. Four wouldn't. What? The set. Are you really into it every single night? People say that all the time. How can they play that long over and over and over? Well, it isn't really that long. It depends on uh, how you conceive of long, you know. Mm. And, uh, well, compared to a regular set by someone. Yeah, regular. see, that, that's one method of comparison. If we compared ourselves to classical Indian music, we play very short. <laughs> Until it rains, you know. Yeah, right. Well, they play, like, you know, for 18 hours without even thinking about it. Mm. So it's, you know, it really depends on what you're measuring against or with, you know, culturally speaking. I really feel that the way entertainment works in this country, the way showbiz works, you know, the Judy Garland tradition, mm -hmm. you know, is uh, 45 minutes, bam, get off, you know, do an encore, that's it, psh, out of there, you know. Then I think that that's a burn as far as I'm concerned. I know every time, I, I've been a fan, you know, I am a fan of music, and if I go to hear somebody play, I really want to hear them do it. Oh, know? yeah. Frequency. And it's artificial, I really don't think it's called for, you know. Yeah. Frequency. Economics, I think, more than anything else, that, that, that I think... They stem from uh, cabaret economics, bar economics, mm -hmm. which is that traditionally bars do a turnover business, right. you know, like cafe shows do a turnover business, so that like if they can squeeze in four shows a night, great, you know, five shows, wonderful, like in Vegas or something, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, turn over the house each time, you know, and then uh, make a lot of money in a small room. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, it's that idea that has created this uh, form of, the short show, you know. And also, uh, the, another thing which is irritating to me is the thing, if you like somebody's work and you go to see their show and find that they, for three shows or four shows or something, they play the identical set, you know. That's also very common. That That's another part of that uh, showbiz formula, you know. Yeah. We're talking to uh, Steve Martin, who is a comedian, but he faces the same problem. People come to his audience with balloons on and he says, you know, they want to hear that joke or the excuse me. And he says, what am I going to do, you know? Yeah. Do it or what? And it's the same thing over and over. Well, we, very early, we decided not to do it. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting that nobody's, that we haven't, you know, people don't come expecting, say, our most f uh, recent album or so-called greatest hits, you know, or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, somebody will come and hope that we do it, but they won't be disappointed if we don't. And well, how do you get uh, this on a record, then? Because you're constricted. You I mean, I don't know whether you do or not. But, I mean, you've made records. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, the way I feel about records, uh, making a record is like uh, building a uh, ship in a bottle. You know? It's a picky, careful kind of, um, you know, highly concentrated kind of work. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with something that's fixed. It's going to stay that way forever. I mean, when you get that ship in the bottle, you're not going to fool with it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's it. Uh, playing music live is like being in a rowboat in the ocean. <laughs> you know, it's very dynamic. It changes every moment. I was going to ask you, then, haven't you considered the guys in the band about, hey, let's make all our albums live then? Screw it, you know. Um, we, there would be a great temptation for us to do that, yeah. Um, the problem of the thing about not doing it is because we don't know when we're going to have a good show. We've had the experience of recording, say, five, sh five shows, mm -hmm. multi-track, which gets to be expensive. And then discovering that none of them was a show that any of us liked very well. You know, mm. So there we are with all this tape, and no show, no mm. record, let's say. Sure. Uh, you're with Ariston now, mm -hmm. uh, and you've been like going around, you had your own company. How do you view the, the record business? Are you in the right situation that you're looking for now? Uh, I like Arista. I don't know whether a right situation is a, very hard for me to conceive for What us. would be the, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, if I could conceive it, I would say it, you know. I think that... By the uh, way, for the straight folks, Arista is a record label. We didn't yes, that. yes. Big Clive. <laughs> uh, what about your own label? I mean, what was well, that's when we discovered how uh, you can't function 
um, really trying to be a record company based on the output of like one or two albums a year, you can't not do it. You can't keep a staff together. You, it doesn't give uh, independent distributors any incentive for paying you, you know, since you're not developing for them a huge amount of product. So that was the problem, the kind of problems that we faced. We also made the unfortunate mistake of starting our own record company the year that polyvinyl chloride went up nine million percent. <laughs> the fuel shortage year. You know, so that that this whole complex of timing problems really made it very con hard. Strange contrast that you're uh, as an artist aware of the uh, free form necessity and yet you really tackle the record business. Well, what because it's uh, well because I'm I'm curious about it for one thing. Uh, for another thing, after making records for a long time and seeing their progress and how they work and uh, making an effort to communicate with people in the record business, you feel that, uh, uh, you, I know that most of the people who are involved, uh, oh my God, <laughs> they know I'm here. <laughs> Must be the New Orleans police. Anyway, <clears throat> you were saying. Well, the record business, uh, after the long time that we spent with Warner Brothers, I uh, met lots and lots of people who work in the record business, and an awful lot of them are people who really like music and were young people and who had, uh, you know, a uh, genuine drive to uh, make changes and to do what they could, and they were doing it because they liked what they were doing, which parallels our experience in music, you know. So it's, it's hard not to like that, you know, uh, that spirit. So, uh, you know, my feeling was... Uh, has been all, all along, you know, to, to, to try to make some effort to improve it. Yeah, or, and to work with it when possible, you know, and so forth. That's so cool. I had his motion picture experience and what might be in store in the future. So I have a personal interest in movies, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know whether the band is going to want to be involved in any other movies, but uh, I have tentative plans to, to uh, do some more film work. Well, it's sometime in the future, but I'm not in any hurry, you know. But you haven't given much thought to television or anything, or possibilities? Not like really. Uh, we've avoided television. Right, I know. Because of um, the connotation. Uh, I don't, I personally don't want to really, don't want to be involved with uh, selling things the way television does. And I don't, I just assume not have that kind of television uh, recognition, and I also don't think that it uh, it communicates music very well. Mm -hmm. What about other other than music? I mean, if we can, uh, I don't mean to refer to drugs mm -hmm. again, but you have certainly had experience with visuals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. So what about something totally away from a performance? I'd be adventure? interested in that, and if there were somebody who was interested in producing such a venture, you know. I <laughs> know. <laughs> That I'd be in, I'd be interested in becoming involved in something like that, but it's the, that's the problem is that it's not like them. It's not like by them I mean networks say mm -hmm. to uh, want to get involved in that sort of thing. I thought, did you see that Ringo Starr special? Yeah. I thought that was kind of neat, you know, uh, considering that it was uh, dealing with a personality who's uh, well known in the music world, and uh, somebody had enough imagination to set up a framework that wasn't was, you know, linear in a television sense, you know, it was like a little drama, you know, a little comedy trip. I thought that was pretty successful for TV. Yeah, but I didn't, still didn't think that the music part of it made it very well. No, it did draw on some favorites. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But what, you know, it affects so many people. Um, I, was, I had to say young people because they're most influential. Did you say infect? <laughs> 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 affects so many people. Uh, but... What, who affected you when you were, uh, where were you when you were eight years old? No one knows about that. Oh my God. That. I mean it. I was somewhere between, uh... Seven and nine, I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> somewhere between uh, Hank Williams and, um, Mahalia Jackson. Anyway, well, I mean, your home, I mean, uh, like... Uh, San Francisco, I was born and raised in San Francisco. Both your folks uh, living there? Uh, no, they're both dead. Oh. How young were you when that transferred? Uh, my father died when I was about four. So I was raised really by my grandparents, who are like grandparents always are very loose. Right. So I had a kind I of. got the energy for discipline. Right? <laughs> yeah, right. I had that unsupervised childhood. Right. And also, San Francisco is the place, uh, uh, the whole bohemian and beatnik tradition, all that stuff, you know, something that I w I've always been very close to. You know, so I've never been uh, self conscious about it. And I've always had a lot of encouragement on the level of uh, if you want, want to do something different, mm -hmm. do it. That was like my input. 
I'm, I can't. It's very hard for me to be analytical about myself just because uh, I'm not doing this by myself. You know, if I were, I would be able to rave about it mm -hmm. from that coming from that point of view. But see, my original background was uh, I was an, an art school person. I was uh, my first talent was visual. That was the first thing that people saw that I could do. That was the first encouragement that I got. It was the first stuff I was involved in. And then at some point or another, I just changed really. I, I think mostly uh, because of not really being all that gifted in that world, and also the thing of not wanting to work by myself. You know, mm -hmm. I just you know there's 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 a certain point where you can make those kind of decisions. Uh, traditionally, an artist is someone who, one who works by himself. You know that that model. You know, the starving artist in the garret. You know, working desperately from some <laughs> depths. You know, <clears throat> for me for, that was really didn't make it. You look for criticism there. Oh yeah, and uh, and uh, the idea of being involved in something which is not totally your own idea, you know that for me that uh, becomes very boring. I mean, as soon as you have an idea, the execution of the idea and so forth, and all those things become work, mm -hmm. and you don't find out whether the idea means anything to anybody until after it's done. And when you're an artist, it might be that you have a wonderful visual flash. You ha it takes you X amount of time to complete it, and then a certain amount of time for people to see it and react to it before you know whether your flash had any kind of relevance, for example, if you care about that, mm -hmm. or whether it communicates uh, at all accurately what you had in, in mind. For me, music is more interesting because it's a dynamic thing, and your decision-making to execution process, your flash to completion is it's instantaneous. And so is the feedback. You know, so, so if you're in a group of people, they're going to say, oh, that turkey idea. Yeah, Media terrible. Idea. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Save your time. That's right. You know, and also, there's the thing of there's sometimes when you're not really having ideas, and there are, there are spaces where you exceed the whole set, <laughs> you know, which is the most interesting of all. When really there, there are times when we come off the stage, and and all of us, you know, comparing notes, there wasn't a one of us that had a single decent idea all night, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and then listen to a tape and find that uh, the music was very good, you know, there was something about it that was exceptional and extraordinary. That starts to get to be magical, you know, in a very strange way. To me, that's a very interesting process. And the process, the Grateful Dead, for me, as an experience, is a process rather than a thing, you know, rather than a model, rather than a completely formulated idea. It's an open end, it's, it's something in process, and the process is what's interesting about it. Jerry going to go to the studio and say, this should sound this way, and you work for eight hours, next day you come back, and it's... It's awful. It's always terrible. It happens all the time. Really. <laughs> you have your own studios, right? Yeah. In your home? Yeah, Weir's got one in his home. Mickey's got one out of the, in his barn. I've got one in our rehearsal hall. Cats Under the Stars is uh, made of that one. Any attraction for uh, synthesized music? Or? Yeah, I'm very attracted to it. I try all that stuff. What it's, instruments do you own, though, of any? I have uh, an Arp Odyssey, a uh, couple of little Roland uh, synthesizers, string synthesizer. We have a Poly Moog. Will that explain the recent uh, increase in orchestration? Yeah, sort of. I am. I like textural changes too in music. It's just it's the thing in music that I like, mm. and it's uh, uh, in a band like the Grateful Dead where there's a great deal of texture. It's, that idea may be redundant. You know, sometimes it's it's a little tricky crowding the orchestration into the Terrapin Station, just mm. because the music that's performed there on the tracks is so dense already. Have you uh, been exposed to classical music? Yeah, quite a lot. Where? Phil has a real serious classical background. My ba my classical background is second hand. My mother was an opera buff, for one thing. Did my father sing? was a musician. Yeah. She did. Yeah. She practiced around the house. Oh yeah, but I didn't really learn uh, music in a classical way, in a traditional way. Phil did, and Mickey did. Those are the two guys in the band, and and uh, Keith. Do you think that classical influence uh, uh, acquainted you with like dynamics and stuff? Oh sure. It just became a part of what was real in music to me, you know, it's, and uh, part of the things that have always attracted me about any kind of music, you know, classical and whatever. You know, good bluegrass music has dynamics like classical music. Sure. Do you uh, find that different audiences come to see you when you tour with your band as opposed to the dead? Um, I'd say so, yeah. Although I don't, I couldn't, I couldn't draw hard lines. But I, I, I feel that they're they're different just because I know that the music's different and the, the nature of the bands are different. There's probably there's overlap certainly, <clears throat> but uh, I don't think it's the same audience. If it were, then my band would sell out the Spectrum too. You know. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
That doesn't yeah, happen. Just, uh, we can have <laughs> well, the, what, have you any idea or have you ever thought that there might be an end to all this at some time? Oh, yeah, but uh, it doesn't, it never seems that way. You know, sometimes uh, it's very hard to imagine it at this point. I, I think uh, we're like I say, we're involved in this process, and because of the nature of being involved in this process, in real time it always looks like it's just beginning. Mm -hmm. It's, oh, I'm glad we finally got that out of the way, you know. Geez, that, that, was, that took a long time to get through, you know. Are you going to be doing any uh, outside projects coming up with other artists? or? Don't think so. Right now, The Grateful Dead is the most interesting thing mm -hmm. happening, uh, as far as I'm concerned. We're, we're hot this year. Let's uh, throw it out to the deadhead. Start off, I'd just like to ask you about a song on Cats Under the Stars, namely, um, what's it, uh, Charisse? Ruben and Charisse. Ruben and Charisse. Yeah. What's the story of that song? Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's based on uh, Orpheus, and further confused by the movie, the Black Orpheus movie. You know, it's kind of like a free poetic uh, reiteration of that idea. You know, and I don't know whether you remember the Orpheus story, but uh, 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 Orpheus uh, has this ability to play beautiful, beautifully well, and uh, everybody loves his music. And uh, his girlfriend uh, Eurydice gets uh, nabbed by uh, the head guy in Hades, and uh, he goes down there and plays so movingly that he decides that uh, the head guy of Hades decides to cut Eurydice loose, provided she follow behind Orpheus and then Orpheus never looked back never doubt you know that's kind of what it's about that's the, what the moral might be called described as not looking back and uh, but he looks back and uh, she's lost to him and he goes on and tremendous sorrow and is eventually I think destroyed by the Athenian woman women <laughs> who get uh, mad at him for some reason so that's kind of how the story goes when follow that who came up with mariachi touch in the arrangement you mean oh, the uh, twin that. horns? Actually, yeah. they're synthesizers. Yeah. Uh, and that's a little line that I'd been experimenting with on the guitar, and then uh, John uh, did it on the synthesizers, and then I did an answer set with the guitar and uh, an envelope filter. And it makes that sort of wah-wah sounding thing. It's really guitar work. And the, the twin horns are uh, John's stuff. So, it's, so it's, the arrangement is his, his and mine together. I noticed that as uh, the tours go by, that uh, that certain songs are added and dropped as the years go by. That's and all right. That. But I was just wondering, what kind of how does those decisions come out? Taste of playing St. Stephen after six years or well, whatever. Uh, see, Phil uh, isn't singing anymore. So all the songs that we used to do that he sang an important part on, we've had a drop until we were able to uh, work out the parts with Donna. So some songs we haven't done because, simply because we haven't worked them out yet, you know. And, uh, you know, other ones uh, like uh, Uncle John's Band and uh, St. Stephen are ones that we had to rework. So Donna would learn the top parts on. Is it hard keeping, uh, let's say, keeping uh, certain songs that you've been playing for 10 years, uh, keeping them fresh? Because uh, I know I've heard various tours and sometimes they do sound fresh, sometimes they don't. Well, and that's... Sometimes it sounds, you know... That's more a function, I think, of the night individually rather than the song or our relationship to it you know sometimes uh, some songs have this longevity you know they can that you can keep on playing them and they always come up sort of fresh some don't some stop working within a year you know Would that be when you might uh, might drop them then or yeah. yeah if we don't all feel really pretty good about it we won't do it stage uh, the way the uh, band is positioned you're usually experiencing like uh, a form of communication, more or less like a telepathy, while you're playing. Now I've noticed like various tours, the positions of the band members would change on stage. Yeah. And this tour, especially, is really different. Yeah. How does how has that affected the communication? Well, we're 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 dealing with a spatial problem that uh, we continually readjust because we redefine it as we go along. Uh, the the thing is this that fundamentally we're trying to figure out a way to be able to address ourselves each other musically to make it so that everybody hears equally well every element of the band but taking into account that everybody has a subjective ideal version of the band that they want to hear in terms of proportions loudness and so forth and so uh, 
in that sense, we're trying to solve a sevenfold spatial problem. That means that seven pieces have to be moved around in certain ways. And the way, it, the kind of the way it works out is there's three moving pieces and three fixed pieces. The drums and the keys have to stay where they are. Me, uh, Phil, and Bobby can move around freely. So, you know, those that's what we have to fool with. So that's uh, the way we go about organizing, uh, you know, the spatiality. But it does have to do with communication. But it's it's it has to do with every kind of commu communication. Turning around and looking at somebody, hearing what somebody intends when they play, you know, all, that, all these things. But it's, uh, and it's tough because we also have to adjust the audience. You know, if we could deal with it in a semicircular, you know, or a, or a circular way, it'd be much more efficient. Uh, mainly, the way I see it is that music is symptomatic of a larger body of evolution which is going on. And it's going on at an, uh, an incredible rate. Music is one very obvious way to look at it. I think all ideas, you know, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm making some sweeping, but I think we're in the, in the process of a, of a huge kind of evolution of consciousness. And it's uh, peaking, getting to the point where it's going to start to peak pretty soon, I think. Jerry Garcia, Grateful Dead. Really appreciate that. Looks like Jerry Garcia, a guitar player. Yeah. Uh, appreciate you coming by the house and uh, being on the show. My pleasure, man. And all the folks here that uh, came by Thank and you asked all. questions and had a good time. Thank you so much. Thank you.